That is not atypical of me. All right, so we are recording. You know, we are going to get the class started now that it is 301. And we are going to continue with what where we left off last time. So scroll all the way back up, up, up. There we go. And we still have a few topics to talk about here. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you uh, re-watched the video recording from the previous class. You know, just the last five minutes would be fine. We basically finished talking about uh, the operators, except for the last one, I think, you know, except for, oh, no, we are not even close to be to that. So this is where we left off. You know, we talked about the uh, difference, okay? And then we are going to start with Cartesian product today. All right, so this is where reading ahead can really help because, you know, the concept of a Cartesian product, which is kind of like a cross product, is a little bit different. It's not exactly a cross product in a certain sense, but it's kind of like a cross product in uh, linear algebra in some other sense. All right, so let's take a look at this description here and see if we can figure out what is A Cartesian product B. Um, how do we describe the output or the definition? The product or the result of A Cartesian product B is a set because we see the braces. So when we look at inside what is inside the braces, it is a description of the membership of that particular set. In other words, it describes every member of this set looks like this, okay? In parentheses, x, y, such that x is in A and y is in B. Are we good so far? What does that mean, right? You know, Every element in the Cartesian product between a set A and set B looks like this, okay? You know, x, y in parentheses, such that x is in A and y is in B. All right, so based on that description, let me see if you guys can figure out, you know, in uh, some examples. So we can go back to the text editor from last time, okay? I hope this looks familiar to you. And if you have taken notes or if you have you know, taken screenshots from the video recording, um, that should be in your notes. So now we are going to look at, uh, let's see what is the AB Cartesian product with, say, 1, 2. And what do you think that's going to be? We know it is a set, okay? So we start with the braces. What is inside the set? Yep. What is it be parentheses A, comma, 1, and parentheses? Comma, open parentheses, B, comma, 2, uh, and parentheses, yeah. Okay, so that would be partially correct, yes? Yes, so the other two elements here are these two. Okay, because it, it doesn't say that, you know, you can only use one element from each set once, so that means we are looking for a pattern where inside the parentheses, you know, for each member inside the Cartesian product, the first member has to come from the set to the left-hand side of the operator. The second member has to come from the right-hand side of the operator. That's the only restriction. You know, it, and we cannot have duplicates. So this is a good time to talk about tuples, okay? Because so far we have only talked about what a set is. So now we can look at you know, what a tuple is. All right, so we'll go back to the notes here and then we continue to read a little bit. So this is the first time we encounter the notion of a tuple. In the definition, the term x, y is a two tuple. The two refers to how many things do we have inside the parentheses. So we can have a three tuple, we can have a four tuple, and so on. A one tuple is not particularly useful, as you can probably imagine, because you can only have one thing inside the parentheses. And you can also have an empty tuple where you have open paren, close paren. There's nothing inside you know, between the open and the closed parentheses. And that's a valid thing. It's just that most of the time it's not very useful, but occasionally it is actually quite useful. All right, a tuple is a container, just like a set is a container, but it is ordered. In other words, 
the ordering of things inside a tuple does matter. Okay, in parentheses one comma two versus in parentheses two comma one are considered two distinct containers because the ordering of the same of the values are different. <coughs> and you can also have duplicate values. So you can have a tuple of open paren one comma one close paren. That's perfectly okay. Two comma two, perfectly okay as well. So it is not a set, okay? A tuple is not a set. It is more like what, okay? You have encountered the concept of a tuple in all your previous programming classes much more often than the concept of a set. What is it? Array. array. Yeah, an array. Or in C++ template classes, you can call it a vector, okay? But they're the same thing, okay? You know, basically, you just, you have a container where ordering is important, and there's no such rule as, oh, everything has to be unique within the container. Are we doing okay so far, you know, understanding what is a tuple? It really is just an array, okay? Or for those of you who are more familiar with scripting languages, it is often also called a list or a, what is the other one? A list, a, an array, and there's one more thing, there's one more term that, that's usually used to refer to these things. I cannot remember. But those are the most common ones. Are we doing okay so far with understanding what a tuple is? Okay. And as a result, our, the definition of the Cartesian pro, in the Cartesian product, each element is a two tuple. Furthermore, the first item of each tuple must be an element of the set A, in this case, in this example, because A is on the left hand side of the operator. And then the second item of each tuple must be an element from the second set B, which is also the set on the right hand side of the operator. All right, questions? Okay. No questions? So uh, I might have you a few questions. Why do we need to understand all of these terms? You know, the Cartesian product, the you know, tuples, and all kinds of stuff like this. Because these are the basic vocabulary in order for us to understand what a function is and also what a relation is. Why do we need to understand functions and relations? Because functions are really important because they can be used to describe a lot of concepts in computer science. And so are relations. So we are just building up the vocabulary so that we can describe the other concepts that we'll build upon these you know, more element, elementary uh, definitions. All right, so I will give you examples, okay? I will let you guys work out some examples. All right, so let's try this. Uh, one Cartesian product with two. Okay. What do you think the outcome is? Minus one, two. Hmm? So one, two as uh, tuple. Yep, that's the only element in this thing. All right, let's do something even more tricky then. We have A, B again. Question? I was going to say, what if you had like like, would there ever be a situation where you would have three sets? Um, you can like, stack. So, okay, I can I understand what you're saying. So you have A, B, Cartesian product of one, two. And then let's just say that yeah, we use explicit parentheses in this case. And these are not tuples, okay? This is just the usual use of parentheses. And then we can just you know, take the outcome of this Cartesian product and say, what if we do this with... Um, XYZ, okay? Well, just XY, because otherwise we'll end up with way too much stuff, right? Okay, so what is this? Well, you just apply the concept in a nested way. So what you do is you say, well, we know what this is, because we just figured this out earlier. So, you know, as lazy as I am, I just copy and paste this. And then we are asking now, what is this thing, Cartesian product with XY? Okay, what do you think it is? How do we figure this out? Well, we just reapply the definition. Okay, you just look up what is the definition of Cartesian product, 
and you go like, oh, okay, so the outcome of this is also going to be a set of two tuples. The first item of each two tuple has to come from, I cannot do this part here. The second one has to come from here. So it is the same thing, okay? I have not changed the way I figure out your know, Cartesian product. It is just in this case, some elements are two tuples to begin with. But no one says that we cannot have a two tuple as one of the items of another two tuple. So now, you know, when we work this out, it's going to be pretty long, so I would use a different notation here, okay? So we'll have, you know, A1 comma X as one element, and then we'll have A2 comma X as an element, and then we have B1, and then we have B2, And then since this is not VI, unfortunately, because I really like to use VI commands in these situations, but let's just hope this editor has a search and replace feature. Uh, where is search and replace, right? So we, oh, it has regular expression too, nice. So we have, uh, we are looking for X. Oops, oops, no, no, do it here. So we are looking for X and we are replacing with y, and we want to replace only in the selection. Oh, it, we just, it just changed my selection. Okay, let me see if that does it. Let me do this. Okay, here's my selection. Go to search, find and replace. Nope, won't let me do it. Okay, fine, we'll just do the, do the hard way. I spend more time looking for a better way to do it than actually just doing it the hard way. But that's typical of me, okay? So that would be the answer. But I, all I did was to treat each tuple from the set to the left-hand side as an element. Because it really is an element. What A1 is just an element. B2 is just an element. So what do I do? I take the element and say, okay, you are now the first element of the of another two tuple. And then I grab x from the set on the right hand side of the operator. And that's it. So that was a that's a good question. You know, basically you're asking, can we stack? Can we nest you know these concepts? And the answer is yep, definitely. Makes it very useful. All right. Yes. Um, is there any particular reason why you put a one x and then a two x rather than like a one x and then b two x? Well, is it just to nope. Be it's just any order. I just want to make it just, you know, slightly more systematic because all of these elements are inside a set, and there's no intrinsic ordering within a set. So I can list the members in any way. But this way, it's easier for me to make sure that I catch everything. So I can do it very randomly, but that makes it harder for me to go like, okay, did I miss one? Because I know there should be eight of these, but if I make it you know, really too random, it makes it kind of harder for me to catch, you know, which one am I missing? Oh, so this is a set of tuples. Yes, it's a set of two tuples in which the first item of each two tuple is a two tuple itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sorry. kind of what I was like thinking of is how would you get like a three tuple? Could you do it? Like, would there be any sort of way to do a three tuple with the Cartesian Cartesian uh, product? Yeah. The answer is a little bit tricky then, because okay. you can basically there are two ways to look at you know when you have a Cartesian product. If one side already has members that are tuples to begin with, you know, are we making a nested tuple, or are we flattening the nested tuple, so A1 in parentheses comma X in all in parentheses will just become A1X you know, inside one single pair of parentheses. So there are, you know, most of the time you want to collapse, but you know, technically speaking, you know, this is the answer based on the definition of the Cartesian product. Okay. 
So we can you know, apply the flattening so that we remove all the structures. Yep. What would be a, a use case for a Cartesian product? Like, I'm trying to see where, well, how you would use it, why you would need it. Mm -hmm. like, this is the basic vocabulary that we need in order to express what is a function and also what a relation is. So we are building up, you know, basically just the alphabets and the basic punctuations and, you know, so that we can string you know, those things together to become words and then string those together to become sentences and string those together to become paragraphs and so on. So we are probably at the phase of defining maybe words at this point. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, the next question is, why do we need to know about functions? Okay, yes. Why do we need to know about functions? Very good, okay. So defining functions is very useful because how do you describe a sorting algorithm? In other words, if I just tell you, okay, you know, this is the input to the sorting algorithm, it is an array with values that can duplicate, okay? And that's it, okay, that's the input. How do you describe the output of a sorting algorithm? How do you describe a validation mathematical statement so that you can say, hey, if the output meets this particular mathematical you know, definition, if this statement in mathematical language is true, then the algorithm has done its job correctly. How would you describe it? So I want you to think about it, you know, because we are not quite at the point of talking about it, but it has something to do about functions. Okay. I'm sure most of you have a few ideas of how to describe the proper output of a sorting you know, algorithm. And I can tell you, until we get to functions, until we get to biject bijection, which is a bijective function, we won't have the co correct vocabulary to explain it. So just take my words for it for now. <laughs> and then later on, we'll get back to this you know, discussion of why do we need to know about functions? All right, so we are moving on. Okay, so we're moving on to the other concepts. All right, so now we are moving on to Boolean uh, binary operators on sets that returns a Boolean value. In other words, the left-hand side and the right-hand side are both you know, sets, but the operator is not giving us a set. It is just giving us an answer of Yes or no. <clears throat> the first one is this one. It is called subset of. Okay, this is subset of. So this is basically saying A is a subset of B if and only if the difference between A and B is an empty set and the intersection between A and B is A itself. All right. Well, I specifically defined it this way. There are other ways to define it. Because I want to see if you guys remember and know how to apply the operators that we have already talked about. All right. Are there any questions? Yep. So this is just asking in two different ways. It's, it's saying, are they the same and are they the same, basically? Not exactly. So when a and when the difference between a and b is empty, it does not mean a and b are indeed the same. So can someone tell me what is the definition of the minus symbol? Yes. I think the length. Hmm? The length. The length. Yeah. Oh, oh. There's no length here, okay? Because a set. Uh, well, we have the I mean, uh, the cardinality, which we'll talk about later. But it has no such thing as a link. Yes. Uh, isn't this that uh, every element that is within list A that is also in list B gets removed out of list? The result of the minus? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, is it, I was going to say whatever is in uh, B is the same as in A. Yes. In other words, the, the best way to talk to say you know, to describe what is the result of A minus B or the difference between A and B is things that are unique in A relative to B. 
things that are unique in uniquely in A. So if they have common things, those would not be a part of the difference. It has to be in A, but not in B. All right, so that's a that's a good exercise, and it makes me want to nag. <laughs> Because where do we find that definition? If I just ask you what is A minus B, the first thing you should do is to say, where's the definition? I should know where the definition is. So where is the definition? If the answer is, I didn't write it down, I have no idea where it is, I would be slightly concerned, okay? Because it's already here. You just have to scroll up. All of these operators are defined earlier. Yes, that it is as well. <laughs> but this is also here. So in case I forget to record an entire lecture, that really should not stop you. That should not even slow you down. Okay? Because the recorded video is only for people to kind of go like, I cannot remember what text said exactly in class. Okay? But if you're here and I did not explain something very well, very well then you can just ask me, right? It's like, okay, I'm not really sure what you meant by blah, 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 okay? Or if you are copying, writing down you know, the notes or you know, trying to record your own thoughts and you go like, okay, I kind of need more time, you know, tech, can you just kind of pause for a moment? You can always just say that, okay, can we slow down or pause, okay, because I need to kind of jot down my notes. That's perfectly okay. Are we good so far? All right. So the definitions are always important. Now, if the definition itself looks kind of cryptic, what are you going to do? What did we do on last Wednesday? For each operator that we define, I did a certain thing. Truth table. Truth table. Well, that's that works here you know, when we have Boolean operators, but with these operators, you know, we did something similar to a truth table, but it's not exactly the same. You do something like slash cap. And, and those are examples. Right. Okay. So the examples can be useful as well because it illustrates when the value is this and the value is this, you know, and you have this operator, that is the output. Okay. So it depends on the person. Okay. You know, I personally prefer, you know, definitions that are like this. And some people go like, no, that's way too abstract. You know, I cannot read that, or at least not yet. And I prefer to have examples to illustrate what it is, and then I would use my own words to describe it. Okay, that really is important, is to figure out how to use your own words to describe the operator. But it's also it's equally important to make sure that your words, okay, the way you describe it is consistent with the definition here which means you have to be able to find those definitions. Okay? Are we good so far? I'm, I, I hope I'm not perceived as nagging, because nagging is never effective, but I do want to point out the importance of knowing where to find definitions. All right, so we move on. All right, so now we know, you know this here, okay, just A minus B, is telling us what is uniquely in A. And we want that to be an empty set. Okay, there's nothing that is uniquely in A, which is saying what? I'll start the sentence and you guys will complete it. Everything in A is in D. Is in D. Exactly, very good. Um, let's see. Not exactly. <laughs> Not exactly. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, if, so not, if it's not exactly, so it's not equal to equivalence then? Well, I said that not exactly is, you know, everything in A is also in B is not exactly what A minus B is an empty set means. It simply means, you know, they do not, sh uh, there's nothing in A that is not found in B. Okay, that is that that is correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So everything in A 
is also in B. Okay, that's correct. And then the second one says here, A intersecting with B is just A. All right. So the question is, is this really needed? In other words, does this implies that? Okay, so if the answer is no, you have to find me a counterexample. If B has more elements than A, it's yeah. not contained within A. Then the intersection will still be A. Yeah. Because the intersection, as somebody asked me, I, I just reviewed the, uh, the video, somebody asked me why we use the word intersection. It has to do with a Venn diagram. So if, let me switch back to uh, the tablet here. So in the, in the case of a Venn diagram, let's say this is A, this is B. Remember this picture? I'm pretty sure we, I drew this, okay? This is the intersection. This portion here is A intersection with B because it's overlapped, okay? Now the entire portion here, okay? So this entire portion here, that those are all A union B. So when I say everything in A is also in B, A has nothing unique compared to B. It really is just saying, oh, everything in A is in B. And if B is bigger, it has more elements, no big deal. Because those would not be in the intersection. When you're looking at a situation where everything in A is also in B, you're looking at A like this, and then B potentially can be bigger than A, but it doesn't matter. Because the intersection is where the two sets overlap. And where they overlap is the entire set of A when B has everything that A has. I do not think they need that second portion for a subset of. That is correct. The second portion is not needed. Okay, there's a hand. So I thought it has to do with. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, in the case that A and B are equal to the witness, A and B are equivalent sets. They do not have to be equivalent. Okay, so I think a few examples are useful in this case. So let's go through some examples, and you guys tell me what the answer is. Okay. So we'll we'll deal with something that's you uh, that's easy first. Okay, so I'm going to say A B is a subset of A B C. Okay, and what do you think the answer is? Is everything on the left hand side also found on the right hand side? Yes. The answer is yes. Okay, very good. Okay, so the answer is true. Okay, very good. And then we have some, you know, this is called a boundary case, subset of AB. And what would be the answer to this question? Yes. It would still be yes, right? You know, everything on the left-hand side is still on the right-hand side. Okay, so it would be yes again. And what about this? AB subset of A. It would be false, okay? B is unique to the left-hand side. Oh, so that means the when you when, when you look at these difference, A B as a set minus A as a set is B. And you know, a set of B is not an empty set, so it does not meet that requirement. Okay, very good. Yep. However, if you were to do B minus A. B minus A subscript of subset A. With that that will also be closed as true. Say that one more time. So <clears throat> Take your time. Um, in the last one where A is A, B, and B is um, just A, uh -huh. if we flip them, it would also come out as true, where B is the first one, B compared to A. So like this? Yes. No. Um, just having um, A be the first one. So, so the a subset, subset of A. a, a yeah. A subset of a, B would be like that. Okay, what do you guys think? It would be true. Okay, very good. And what about this? 
Aha. <laughs> is an empty set a subset of set that a set that has one element in it? It doesn't even matter what it is, but one is empty and the other one is not empty. Yep. Would it just come out false? It is still true. Yes. It is still true. Okay. In fact, this is also true. <laughs> All right. So it's difficult, okay, but it's not difficult to understand this because if you look at the definition, what is the difference between an empty set and the empty set? In other words, I'm asking, give me a set where you know, the items are, can be found on the left-hand side but not on the right-hand side of the minus you know, operator. The answer is nothing, right? You know, we have an empty set. Okay, wait, an empty set is... Is meaningful. Why is it meaningful? Isn't that somewhere within our definition right here? So if A is an empty set, B is an empty set, then A minus B is an empty set. We talked about that already last Wednesday. What about the intersection? Things that, be, that can be found in both sets. What can you find that is common between an empty set and an empty set? It's also nothing. Well, wait, but all three are, oh, I should say all four, okay? Because A is empty, B is empty, A intersecting with B is empty, A is also empty. Empty set equals the empty set is true. So we have true and true. So that means an empty set is a subset of itself. Yes? So how does the empty set be a subset of the set that it was paid for? How can the empty set be a subset of? Um, just A. Like, for example, the one we Oh, OK. So let's go back to the example. You mean this one, the, la the second to the last one, this one here? Well, it still meets the requirement. Because what is empty set minus the set that has only A in it? Everything that is unique to the left-hand side, right? So what is unique to an empty set? Nothing. Has got to be nothing, because it has nothing to begin with. So empty set minus the set that only has A in it is an empty set. Because there's nothing to compare. Oh, okay. Right? And then what is the intersection between an empty set and a set that has one item in it? What is common between an empty set and a set that has an element in it? I don't even care what it is. There's nothing in common. Right, because the empty set has nothing to begin with. So it still meets that requirement. It still meets the definition that you know um, the empty set is a subset of a set that has just one element in it. In other words, an empty set is a subset of everybody, as long as that other body is a set of some kind. Okay? So it's the boundary cases that can be tricky. It's when, the, when, you, when you're encountering the boundary cases, it is important to go back to the definitions. Okay? Are we doing okay so far? Yep. So in the definition of subset of, uh, since uh, I guess we determined that the right-hand side of it is, I guess, redundant, why is it in the definition then? Because I made a mistake. <laughs> but it is not exactly a mistake because it is not wrong either. In other words, okay, let's go back to my you know kind of unnecessarily long definition. So let's just say, okay, you know, without a mathematical proof, that this is not needed. In other words, when this is true, this is automatically true. When this is false, this is also automatically false. Let's just say that is the case. Well, actually, if this is false, I don't even I don't even care what this is because you know, when one side is false, the whole thing is going to be false anyway. Okay, so I only have to show that when this is true, this also has to be true. Yes, I was going to say, uh, doesn't the right side also imply the left? No, that is definitely not the case. A intersecting with B. Oh, it is. Yep. Okay. Yep, you're you're correct. Double checking. Yep, yeah. that is also true. So 
So that makes a very unique case because it means, you know, this conjunction here has these two expressions, you know, having, they are both true at the same time and they're both false at the same time. Now, the question is, is that wrong? It is not wrong. It is just, eh, why do you make it longer than it has to be? But it is not wrong in the sense that, you know, this format will give you the wrong answer. <clears throat> is that okay? Does everybody understand, you know, what wrong means in this context? When you have a definition that will give you a different value from what it is supposed to be, it is wrong. If you have an expression that is unnecessarily long, but it always still gives you the correct answer, it is still not wrong. It's just, eh, it's unnecessarily long. And that's one of the cases here. Are we do okay so far? All right. So once we understand what a subset is, let's look at this one here. Do you see how close these, these two symbols are? What are they off by? How, how are they different? That little bar thing, right? Kind of like the differences between a less than or equal to versus a less than. So the bottom one, okay, the one where the mouse cursor is, is called a proper subset of. Okay, so A is a proper subset of B, if and only if A is a subset of B, and this time we have B minus A being A does not equal to an empty set. In other words, you have to have something unique to B in order for B, in order for A to be a proper subset of B. So, so that's just all sorry for the boundary Um, yes, that is correct. So what we'll do is we're gonna redo the examples, but this time for the proper subset of. So we go here, and then we'll just copy and paste. <clears throat> And then just you know, add the word proper subset of. So proper subset of. Yeah, I don't have a way to type in the operator when I'm in a plain text editor. I thought about using Joplin. I'll show you guys Joplin maybe at some point. But I kind of decided against it because you know, it is also a little bit messy when you guys look at it. So we'll take away all the answers. With VI, I can do all of this with one single command. Yep, there we go. All right, so the question is, is the set AB, or the set containing A and B, a proper subset of the set contain, you know, containing A, B, and C? Yes. Okay, that's good. What about the second one? Is the set containing A, B a proper subset of the set containing the, the elements A and B? No. Aha, good job, you guys caught this. Uh, what about this one? No. Well, this one has to be false because it's not even a subset to begin with. If it's not a subset to begin with, it cannot possibly be a proper subset, okay? So we'll take, make this a false too. What about this one? Okay, it is true. Why would this be false? The set on the right hand side has a unique element. Okay, and it is a subset to begin with. And now that we confirm that B is only on the right hand side, that makes it a that makes uh, the left hand side a proper subset of the right hand side. What about this one? Oh, boundary case again. But this one is true this time. Because the element A is unique to the right hand side. What about the last one? The last one is false. Very good. All right. So are the examples helping you know, in terms of you know to, to understand the concept? Okay, very good. So it's time to take roll. My little Fitbit just buzzed me. So we'll go to roll taking mode. And today is the 28th, and I totally forgot to set it up. Oh, okay. Well, I can set it up now. Copy to. Oh, this is this is going to be fun. Uh, let's 
11108. So I am copying to the same class and select the module, set theory, and we want this to be right after the same name. <laughs> All right. So we'll, we'll let it do its own thing. You probably cannot participate anyway because it's, it's not going to reset the due date. So it's going to have a due date of um, August 23rd anyway. So you cannot really do anything about it until I make changes. So let me go in, make the necessary changes. And Oh, we'll make it nay this time. All right. I'll give you guys up to 4 p.m. to do it. Hopefully, you can type fast enough and navigate your mouse pointers, touch your screen or whatever you do. Save. All right. Refresh your screen, and you should see. Oh, I should probably rename it. Otherwise, it is confusing, too. All right. So, we'll rename it to today's date. There we go. All right, so you should see it as August 28th now. Just go ahead and you'll and participate and... Is there a password? Uh, it's Nay, N-A-Y. It was yay last time, so it's Nay this time. Does this mean they have to answer false to... Hmm? So does this mean they have to answer false to <laughs> class today? I should have changed the uh, the question to I am not. Uh, I'm not present today. So then you have to you have to use false this time. All right. <sighs> Uh, with this class, you have to read the questions very carefully because apparently I have, I can make things very tricky without trying. Yep. That's what some students have told me. All right. So assuming most of you are done, let's continue then. All right. So we have subset of, proper subset of, and... Oh, the last one is cardinality. It's a little, it's kind of like a little side note. Many times we're interested in the number of elements in a set X, the notation bar X bar, which you know, most people say, oh, it's absolute value. Man, I'm reusing the symbol. It's called the cardinality of X, which is essentially the number of elements in X. So for example, the cardinality of the set that has four members, two, four, six, eight, is four. So be okay with cardinality. It's basically quote unquote the length of a set, but you, know, you don't use length because length implies there's ordering. So you can say the size of a set. I'll be good so far with this particular module. Okay, all right. So look, let's move on to something more fun. It's called quantifiers. Can someone tell me how, do you know that I'm going to talk about basic quantifiers? Okay, and, and what gave that away? The, the links within Canvas, do you think this, this should be seen as a set, or do you think this should be seen as a tuple? Just to reapply the same concepts that we have just learned today. So are we looking at a set of topics, or are we looking at a tuple of sets. What am I really asking? Is ordering important? What do you think? Yes. Tuple. Yes. Tuple. 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 Yes, that is correct because if ordering is important because I just follow the order, you know, this is the next topic. Which means for this class, reading assignment is implicit. It is always just whatever module is after the one that I'm talking about. Is that okay? So there's no need to ask me, so what should I read after this? It's like, just follow the, the next one. Are we good so far? All right. 
So let's talk about quantifiers, which sounds a lot more in intimidating than it really is. All right, so we talk about basic quantifiers. <clears throat> so quantifiers implicit are Im implicitly applied to everything or nothing in the universe. To make our discussion more concise, let us use variable x to refer to a thing that we are examining, and p of x is some kind of Boolean function applied to x. This means that depending on what x is, p of x is either true or false. It is a predicate. We have already talked about the term of a predicate, which really is just a function that returns a Boolean. That's all a predicate is. So to say that everything in the universe makes p of x true, we use the following expression, and this is the universal quantifier, which, which is also known as, okay, the, the mathematical name for this is for all, okay, for all. And you say, I don't like to use that phrase, okay? How, how about do, using a term that we use every single day? That is really a poor question because the answer is embedded in the question itself. What do you think that word is? What is the most common, what is the common word that we can use instead of for all in everyday languages? Every. <laughs> okay, that inverted A symbol literally just means every. Okay, okay? it applies to every. All right, and it's also, you know, in, I think, in the paragraphs to follow. Okay, so. So in English, this is literally for all x in the universe, p of x is true, and, which also means it is just every. This one is called there exist, okay? So this means, it's, this one is saying there exists at least one thing in the entire universe such that p of x is true. So I can find at least one x such that p of x is true. And what, which word in everyday language specifies the same thing? At least one, okay? Or one, some people would use one, but at least one is a more precise description. So now we know the for all, which is every, and then the there exist means, you know, at least one. Are we good so far? Okay. Can anyone remember a day in which you did not use every or at least one or one? That means we already understand the basic concepts of the quantifiers, okay? It's just that in this class, they have a specific funny symbol associated with it so that we can use these things to define you know, further concepts, you know, more complicated concepts. So now we want to apply negation on top of quantifiers, okay? So this thing here, okay, it is not the case that at least one thing in the universe will make P of X true. It's really saying the same thing as everything in the universe X is going to make P of X false. Does that make sense to you? Does it intuitively make sense to you? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so what about the other way around? It is not the case that everything in the universe is going to make P of X true. Is it the same thing as there exists at least one thing in the whole universe that makes p of x false. What do you think? Yep, that really is the case. Okay. All right. So I'm I'm kind of surprised that nobody asked me what do you mean by everything in the universe? I mean everything in the universe. You, me, your car, all the numbers all the alphabet, all the words, and so on and so forth. Yep? What would this be used for, and what is the applications of this? It allows us to be much more precise when we say, you know, this has to be true. Then you go like, okay, but it's not, 
is it applicable to these things or is it applicable to these things? No, we are specifically applying this to only those things. So it gives us the ability to control the scope of what we are talking about. That's one. And then it also helps us you know, differentiate between, do we need everything here to make that true? Or do we just need one of these things to make it true? Or at least one thing to make it true? So I'll give you an example, OK? Let's say the Los Rios district is uh, given us a prize, OK? Of the four colleges, they say, hey, if you can find me a department where every professor is a e effective professor, then we'll award the department with this chunk of money, OK? So within the CIS department here, I'm the only one that is not effective, <laughs> OK? So the question is, do you think the department is going to get the award? No. But it is important to understand you know, what qualifies for the award. Because if the district says, if at least one professor within the department is an effective professor, you still get this award. Then I go to you know, Iraj and say, hey, Iraj, can you be an effective professor for one semester? He goes like, sure. Then we all, you know, then we share that chunk of money. Is that making sense? So it is important to differentiate and say, do we need to apply this to everything within this collection? Or are we just talking about at least one of these things that needs to meet the requirement? We good? So we are basically just building up the vocabulary or the symbols in order to express other things that are more meaningful. All right. So. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, it is not always that we want to apply a, pre a predicate to everything because some predicates do not make sense to certain things. Okay, so let's just say your p of x is saying x is an even number. Okay, so p of x is asking is x a even number? True or false? That's pretty easy. Okay, is four is p of four? What is the value of p of four? True, okay. What is P of three? False. False. P of negative six? True. True again. What about P of 3.14? Go like, hmm. Are we stopping there or are we going on? Oh, we can, we can, we can, we can go off like, you know, what, what about P of tech? What do you mean by P of tech? This is a type mismatch error if it's, if it's, if it's fed to the compiler, it will say tag is not an integer, so p of tag is not a good, you know, it's not a good construct. Type mismatch, right? So we want to limit the predicates to only apply to certain things, and we'll just ignore everything else in the entire universe. So how can we do that? So let's just say that you know e, this is what we want to do. We want you know, to limit the application of P of E to things in the set X. Let me say that one more time. We, on, we only care about P, the, the predicate P, applied to elements that are in some kind of set X. What about all of those other things in the <coughs> universe that are not in the set X? They should not change the answer. Okay, We simply do not care. Are we good so far? So the way we do it is to use an implication. So this is kind of the same thing, except this time we have the implication of E being an element of X implies and then P of E again. So how does that do the filtering effect? In other words, what happens to the, um, okay, let me point out here. So what happens to this entire expression when E is not an element of x. So we'll think about an element that is not in x. What happens to this entire expression? Yes? We do not know if it becomes true or false because the uh, starter point, starting point is false. So well, no, because we have an implication. Yes? It becomes false. It becomes, OK, I like the fact that you know it has a value, but it is not false. What do you think it is? I thought that was not determined. 
Okay, so let me say that one more time. Okay. Um, okay, let's make a concrete case. Okay, let's make a very concrete example and then we'll take a look at that example. So we'll go to the text editor again and at this time we'll, um, we'll define x to be, I don't know, let's define it to be 2, uh, 4, 6. And then we'll define p of e to be, oh, let me think. We can do the even thing, I suppose. Okay, well, we can do the even thing. Let's do the even thing. So we'll say, you know, um, e mod 2 <coughs> is 0. Are we good? Okay, does everybody understand this notation? e mod 2 is 0, meaning e is even. Okay. Okay. So now we say for all x, x is in, oh, I should probably should not use lowercase x here. I, I'll use something else. W, okay? So for all W, W in X implies P of W. Okay, now, what what is W, okay? What value can do we need to consider for W itself, okay? Well, everything in the universe, okay? Because it's a universal quantifier, and that's why it's called a universal quantifier, because it applies to everything in the universe. They didn't quite say anything about the multiverse, but you know, that's kind of beyond the scope of this class. You have to ask Marvel you know, whether you know, we should consider multiverse to be a part of this thing. But we're not going to go there. Okay. So this W here can, is, can bind to everything in the entire universe. So I'm, I would just say, okay, let's, let's just bind this W to the, the value of pi, okay? 3.14 something, okay? So when W equals to 1.14, 3.14, what happens to this implication? Is that, impl is that expression returning true or is it returning false? The expression what? is returning true. It is returning true, why? Therefore, the expression is not. Therefore, the implication is true. Okay, because the implication says if the left hand side is false, then the implication itself as an operator is true. So that means you know if for anything that is not in X, it can be 3.14, it can be tag, it can be your car, it can be Professor Iraj, and so on and so forth. We just say, oh, it, this whole thing is just going to be true, which means it is of no consequence to us. I thought you were talking about just the P of W, what that would have become. Yes, but W can bind to any, any value in the universe. So when it binds to pi, then the expression you know, after the for all W, it is true. But the reason why it is true has to do with the implication operator. Because the implication operator returns true when the left hand side is false. It, it doesn't care about what is P of W when W in X is false already. Do we have a question about this statement? Okay, the first the first question I have is how do you double check that? You know, how do you know? that in the implication when the left hand side is false, the implication itself is true. How do we know that? When we talked about Boolean operators. Okay, so that is important. Okay, knowing, being able to locate the definition that matters in this other definition, knowing the chain of definitions. This definition depends on those definitions these definitions depend on those definitions. Knowing that chain, being able to make connections within that chain is really important. Are we good so far? Okay. So we can filter things, okay? In other words, now we are basically saying 
all. All we really care is whether these three are even numbers or not. But there are other even numbers in the world. I don't care. And there are also a lot of things that are not even numbers. I don't care. And there are a lot of things we cannot even say whether it's an even number or not. I also do not care, because all I really care is two, four, and six in this example. I filter everything down to just the answer of p of w when w is two, four, or six. For everything else, I do not care. Yep. So, are you saying that in the scope of this class, like sets can include? Words or yeah, whatever. Like like yeah. Mhm. Mm yep. 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 Go ahead. Can you give an example where that expression is false? Which expression? Uh, the, the, yeah. uh, when you refer to that expression, since I'm not a mind reader, I cannot read the, uh, what that is referring to. For all w w in f imply p of w. Sure. It's easy. I just have to change this to that. Now the universally quantified statement is false. Okay, let me read that to you. So if I change p of e to this, okay, your meaning is e an odd number, okay, then this statement is going to be false, okay. For all w in the entire universe, w in x implies p of w is true, is going to be false. Because guess what? I found counter examples. What happens when w is two? Well, when w is two, p of w is two mod two, which is a zero, equals to one. That is false. But if there's at least one thing, if at least one thing is false, then the universal quantified, universally quantified statement is false. Because in order for a universally quantified statement to be true, everything has to make this portion true. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, when the case when uh, w is three point fourteen, it will be uh, false. When no, it will still be. Right? It will still be true. This portion will still be true, but the universally quantified statement is going to be false. So w is not in x. So which makes that implication is true. Yes. So. That whole thing is really true, right? Not when it's universally quantified. Okay, I can see the confusion here. Let me see if I can explain this using a oh C code. Okay, so we'll go for the C code approach. So I'll, I'll answer the questions and then we'll go into the C code. Yes, I thought you were talking about because W is still equal to three point one four, so you'd have to change the W equals three point one four to W equals like two four six. Right. So, okay. So when this is, uh, let me let, let me let me finish this then. So I will spell out the expression. Is true, okay. <clears throat> and then we'll say when w is uh, two, this is false. Does that make sense? Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, so I think in general, it's probably good for me to give you the pseudo C code thing to explain what is for all and what is there exists. So I'm gonna write it as C code and for all. And we do not have the um, set as a type in C and C++, so you know, I'm not counting the template class because your template class implies you know, everything in the set has to be of the same type. But that's not a requirement here. So I'm just going to imagine that we do have the concept of a set. Okay. So in this case, I use the set X, you know, as a um, in this example, and then we'll say uh, P. You know, I'm not going to pass P as a parameter because you know, that's that's just going to make things a little bit more icky. So so the for all thing has to iterate through all the elements. In the entire universe. Okay, so how should I do this? There's no, there's nothing I can use in C and C++ you know, to 
refer to the universe. Um, yep. Couldn't you just uh, assume like an element sort of thing? That'd be the, so for uh, parentheses, element I. Uh, yeah, we don't have an iterator set. through uh, a set either, not in C notation. If I want to do this in JavaScript, it would be pretty easy because there are there, there are notions of iterators, um, but there's there are no such thing in C and C plus plus, so it makes it kind of hard to explain this. Oh, I know what. Okay, ha, ah, that will work. Um, okay, I want to stay here. <clears throat> So I am jumping, you know, I'm not going very sequentially at this point. So I think I put in, okay, let me see if I have recursion here, recursive definition and algorithms. I forgot to put it here. Okay, let me see if I can search and find it. Okay, so let's give me a second here. This is an easy way for me to search through all my modules. And we are looking for recursion. Not recur recursive definition of algorithms. It's one of my newer ones. Ah, right there. Okay. This is going to be useful. This is going to be fun. All right. So, so this is a digression, but it is an important digression, I think. All right, so we are going to start with summation, okay? So yes, we are taking a unexpected turn in this journey, but this is important. So we'll talk about summation first. So I give you a very concrete case. The sigma of i starting from two to five, i squared is two squared plus three squared plus four squared plus five squared. Is that okay? This is the usual, typical way of looking at summation. It is a concrete example. So if I were to ask, you know, how to express, how, how to define, you know, some, uh, the sigma or summation, it's kind of hard to describe, okay? You know, I can describe it in words and say, this is the lower bound, this is the upper bound. We increase the index by one for each iteration. We compute whatever expressions we are summing, and we just add it all up together. Okay, that's one way to describe it. To you guys who are who already understand what is sigma or the summation notation, you go like, yeah, that sounds about right. For people who do not know it, you know that description is awfully vague. So what can what can we do to define the you know, sigma? So I am using a. Oh, I just passed it right here. This is the recursive definition to define sigma using the ternary operator. So let's let's take a look at this one here, okay? What is the summation where i goes from b beginning to e end of f of i, okay? What is the definition? The definition is a ternary expression. So first of all, let me make sure that we all remember what a ternary expression is. So what is a ternary expression? Go ahead. It is a conditional statement. It is. It does involve if and only if. It has three portions. The portion that is to the left of the question mark is a condition to evaluate. Okay, and then the portion between the question mark and the colon is the overall value of the entire ternary expression. If and only if. I like the, the that phrase. If and only if the condition is true. And then the portion that is after the colon is the value of the entire ternary expression when, if and only if, okay, the condition is false. Are we doing okay so far? It is really just an if then else, okay? If this, then this, else this. Is that okay? So a ternary expression is a conditional statement compressed into a single statement. Are we good so far? Okay. So now that we know what is a ternary expression, 
we focus on this particular one. It says, if the beginning is greater than the end, then we no longer have anything to consider. So if you have nothing to consider in a summation, we'll just say it's just zero. Are we good so far? Uh, what about the else? Well, the else is saying B is less than or equal to E. Well, if B is less than or equal to E, then it go like, so there's at least one thing in the summation. Does that make sense? If B is less than or equal to E, we have at least one item to evaluate. Yes? Okay? And that item turns out to be just F of B. Okay? You go like, but wait, tack it up. We only have to evaluate F of B if and only if B and E are exactly the same. But in order to end up here, B only has to be less than or equal to E. In other words, E can be greater than B. I go like, but I'm lazy. I'll just defer that calculation to somebody else. The rest of the sigma is just, oh, just ignore the case when I equals to B. Start with B plus one and do this whole thing again. Is that okay? So that, yes? Uh, but uh, you, you can't integrate through a set B plus one. Uh, it's part of a standard language. I cannot uh, hear you, sorry. Uh, you, can, you can't iterate through a set of uh, standard language. You cannot? You, you can. There's the same iterator mm -hmm. for loop, so that is type of the iterator. Oh, okay. And then, yeah. So, but it has to be a list. Uh, it can be a list, but I mean, I I figured that the set would be. I think you can define an iterator in any class, and as long as you have that iterator method defined, that syntax will still work. Okay, but thank you. So, but this this one, are we okay with this definition of sub summation? Okay. So what does that have anything to do with the universal quantifier versus the existential quantifier? So we skip a few things, and then we have the pi, and then the n, and then the or, the big n, the big or. And then we move on to the existential quantifier. All right, so the existential, okay, let, so in order to get here, we have to understand the big n, the big or. We should be able to do this. I mean, this is new to you, but not that new. Okay, so we're focusing on the big or operator. This one, this one here. So what is the difference between this and the sigma notation? There are two main differences, or I should say three differences, three main differences, the symbol, Okay, instead of sigma, we have big D. Instead of sigma, we have big D. Okay, that's one difference. The second difference is this zero means false. Okay, it is not the numerical zero, it, it means false. The third difference is, oh, instead of addition, we have disjunction. Those are the only three differences in this case. So the big or is simply saying f of i is returning a true false value, and this entire thing is true if and only if at least one item between E and E, B and E, will make F of I true. Okay, it's a huge, gigantic disjunction. That's all it is. Are we good so far with the disjunction discussion? Okay. So once we have the big OR, we can now define the existential operator. Because the existential operator, uh, this notation means that you know, we are already focusing on just elements in X. This means you know, we are focusing on just elements in X. If at least one thing in X can make F of E true, then the exist existentially quantified statement is true. Are we still doing okay? Are you guys still kind of following? Okay. All right. Hmm? Can you repeat what you just said? <laughs> okay, so this notation, because I jumped ahead a little bit here, this notation is saying if at least one element of x makes f of e true, then this entire thing is true. So given x is a set, okay, I'm only asking 
give me at least one element that will make f of e true, then the whole thing, the quantified statement itself, is true. In other words, it's false if and only if nothing in x can make f of e true. Is that OK? So that really is saying the same thing as the big OR notation here, iterating everything in x. But we haven't talked about iterating things in x. So in order to you know, fix this problem, I define a function d. So the new notation d, d of x is going to deterministically draw an element from a non-empty set x. What does that mean? It means if you give me a non-empty set x, d of x will consistently return exactly the same element. That's all I say, okay? But exactly which one are we choosing? I don't care. It's, it's just the fact that it is very deterministic. Is that okay? No, maybe. Can you give us a second example? Um, an example of oh, the D of X? Okay. Uh, I can give you tons of examples. But one example of such a D is like this, okay? So we can say, you know, um, D of, it's hard to give you all the examples, but I can say if the set is has A, and A, B, and C in it, I'll always say this is A. And then I can say D of B, C, I don't care, let's just pick one. And then D of B has no choice, but to say it is always B. This is one way to define the function D. Function D is really just a helper function. It is just saying, hey, give me a set, and I'm going to pick one item out of the set for you. That's all it is. It, it just picks one. Given the same set, it always picks the same element out of the set. That's the bottom line. Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> there, there are many ways to define the, the function D. It, the, the bottom line is it picks an element out of a set, a non-empty set. Yes? That's where you say it's not random? It is nice if it is deterministic. But you get to define this function. So you can make it do anything you want as long as it is returning an element of the set that is its parameter. And that it removes it from the set. It does not remove anything. It just says, OK, so let's say you are the function, and I'm giving you a bag. A set is basically a bag of stuff, right? right. So as long as you pick exactly the same item, assuming the bag has exactly the same items in it, then we have satisfied the requirement. You can always say, I'm just going to pick the first one. OK, that's fine. Okay, Or you can, you can say, I'm always, always going to pick the heaviest. That's fine, too. So, so when this version of D, D could be anything that you define, but for it to actually be a deterministic function, it would always have to go ACB. ACB. Well, this is how I defined this particular one, but you can always define it to be something different. Okay. So given that then you know, this expression here, which is super easy, is the same thing as this thing over here. Now, I'm not probably going to have enough time to talk about this, but we'll go over this right now and say, but can we understand these particular concepts? Okay, first of all, do we understand a ternary expression, which is the outermost part of it? It is question mark, colon. Okay, we got that. Two, can we determine whether a set is empty or not? Yeah, I mean, you know, if a set has nothing in it, it is empty. Okay, this is false. Okay, so false is just written as a zero. And now we have, okay, forget about D for now, uh, F for now. D of X is what we just talked about. It's like, given the same items in the set, I always pick exactly the same item every single time. Okay, what is F of that item? Well, f is the predicate on this side, so it can always return you know, either true or false, given a particular thing. And then, what is this? 
This is just a regular OR. Okay, very good. And this is the big OR you know, notation, which we defined a little bit earlier. And this one basically says, you know, we are going to iterate through every element in this. Okay, that's, what is this? It, 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 it's a set operator, it's different. So everything in X, except for this thing here. So we are excluding D of X, which is a particular item from the set D, from the set X, and say, we are only concerned about things that are in X, but not the one that we have chosen to evaluate over here. But for the rest of the item, we just make a gigantic OR operation and we'll apply F of E to it. Is that okay? Yep. What, um, what's being ordered in that, in this, it's not summation, obviously, but the, the big OR, what's being ordered with F of E? All right, so maybe, I know we are running out of time, but I think it's kind of important to go over this so let's say we are looking at, um, it, there exists x in, um, we can use the same set here, 2, 4, 6. Um, and then we'll evaluate the qualifier is um, x, is, x is greater than 5. Okay, all right. So using okay, I cannot see that. Okay, I think we'll just go ahead and evaluate this by hand first, and then in the following class we'll go back to that notation. So what what do you think is the, is the answer to this? Is it true or is it false? True. It is true because. Of the three things in the set, six is greater than five. But the important thing is this thing boils down to two is greater than five, or four is greater than five, or six is greater than five. That is the important part. I'm turning the existential quantifier into just a big or. Just apply the predicate to everything in X and then or everybody together. That becomes the answer of the existential quantifier. All right, so um, please read through the quantifier discussion, you know, the module, and then on Wednesday, we'll come back and see if we can, you know, kind of go through this discussion using the recursive definition. And it might be helpful to go back to the summation definition first because we are familiar with summation already. So the way I use a recursive definition to describe a summation can help you understand the other one, which is a little bit more complicated. Alrighty. So I'll stop the recorder and upload it. And I'll see you guys on...